Hello, welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, I'm Joe, I'm on my own, and in the interest of Christmas and everybody trying to get things done and run around to crazy families and stuff, we're going to give you another interview that I did during uh, Maker Fair Milwaukee. Now, this one is um, with a guy named Brian Sarah, and he did some really, really cool things. We'll explain it in the interview, and then um, when we come back, uh, I'll recap just a little bit. So with that, here is the interview with Brian. All right, so uh, this is Joe for uh, Makers on Tap, and... um, I found a guy at the Milwaukee Maker Fair that's just got a really, really cool project, and I thought I'd sit down and interview him for a few minutes. So um, can you tell us your name and uh, a little bit about your project? Um, (laughs) I'll kind of ask you questions along the way, but... Yeah, sure. That's that's great. Um, My name's Brian Sarah. And uh, I'm from Milwaukee, but right now I live in Calgary, Alberta. I teach at an art university. And, uh, but I, I come back to Maker Faire every year because it's great. It's actually quite a bit better than a lot of the Maker Faires I've seen in other cities. So, Yeah, this, this is um, my first time at one of the bigger Maker Faires, and I'm blown away. Like, yeah. Th- this is wonderful. I'm really upset that I haven't been to this one yet. So. Yeah, they really do a good job here. It's super well organized, and it's really great for the makers, too. Like, we show up, and there are people ready to help you get your space set up and uh, get you a cart. And, yeah, I, I've participated in maker fairs where you show up, and you're like, hello? Is there a volunteer somewhere? I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. so this is great. I ran that maker fair. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So um, the project you have set up here is like a little robot arm doing some clay printing, but it, this was just was so neat um, and so different than some of the other kind of clay 3D printing projects I've seen. Uh, what what got you started in it, and like kind of like can you tell me a little bit about your process and and that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I I mean. I, I started doing 3D printing and digital fabrication in grad school. I had this mentor, uh, Frankie Flood, who right now he teaches in jewelry and metals at App State University. And um, I, I got really interested in digital fabrication. I was already doing a lot of like creative coding and programming, and it, it just felt like it was a really great extension of that and a way for me to extend my practice from pixels to like actual matter. And, and objects. And, um, and so I, I, I've been doing 3D printing stuff for maybe eight or nine years. And then um, what got me into the ceramic 3D printing was really kind of two things. One, I was becoming interested in just kind of experimenting with geometry, 3D printing geometry, um, you know, basically combining programming knowledge and 3D modeling knowledge and creating like algorithmic algorithm that generate 3D models. Yeah. And so I wanted to experiment and do 3D printing, but I didn't want to create a bunch of plastic garbage. So this was a way for me to 3D print with clay, which is, you know, it's a, extracted from the earth, it's envir- relatively environmentally friendly. Um, and then I could basically 3D print something, document it, and then destroy it and immediately reuse the material okay. for more 3D prints. But then at the same time, I started teaching at the uh, Alberta College of Art and Design where there's a really strong ceramics program and also just really great ceramics instructors and a lot of energy in that area. So those two things combined just made it, got me really hooked in ceramics in general and just in the culture. You know, it's a really interesting culture because it's, uh, obviously it's a maker culture, Mm -hmm. but it's one where everyone is really eager to, to teach you about all the tips and tricks that they've acquired over the years. That's awesome. Yeah, but people pin you to the wall about this stuff, and it's really exciting. And and to just be in a community like that, you know, I've participated in communities like that on the internet. So to have an IRL version of that was exciting. Right. Um, and so I've been doing the ceramic 3D print- printing for about two years, and just 
you know, I, I did originally research a bit, did a bit of research to, and, and found that there are a lot of people doing this. Right. And there are a lot of different ways to do it. And rather than like building a, an open source kit, I thought it would be fun to, to figure it out for myself and to have a printer that I really understood in and out because yeah. it's like my baby. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so I, I built three different th ceramic 3D printers. And the first one just used like a stepper motor with that drove a, a plunger into a syringe, like a off the sh shelf 60 milliliter syringe. Okay. And I did a ton of work with that. And I would even like pause the print and then swap out the syringe and resume the print to make big stuff. Um, and then over time I decided to build something a little bit more customized and lar and with the capacity to do larger volume stuff. I wanted to be able to print big stuff like, you know, figurative sculpture or whatever I wanted to do. Right. And um, so then I built this, the one that I'm kind of ex exhibiting here. I say kind of because I'm using the extruder that I designed along with a off the shelf robotic arm called a Dubot arm. It's just like a cool little versatile desktop robotic arm. Yeah, that was actually what made me stop at your booth. Was yeah, that's the other thing that I like. I thought like the idea of bringing that to Maker Fair because versus like an XYZ or a Delta 3D printer, a robotic arm, you know, it's it's so easy to like anthropomorphize, and mm -hmm. so it catches people's attention because it looks like a little creature building something. Yeah. Um, so and it's and it's different. You know, I'm in this 3D printing section. And I think it's the only robotic arm in the section. Yes. And it is representative of a huge part of the 3D printing industry, which is, you know, putting 3D printing hot end uh, or whatever, in this case, a ceramic extruder on the end of a robotic arm. Yeah, yeah. So you were saying earlier uh, when we were talking that you don't actually build your objects from 3D models. Yeah. I mean, not anymore. I do that a little bit. I do that with my students. Okay. Um, but yeah, usually for 3D printing, uh, you create a 3D model in some CAD software or 3D modeling software like Blender or something. Right. Um, and I teach a couple of those softwares. I teach Rhinoceros, and I teach Autodesk Fusion 360, and I teach Autodesk Inventor, um, and a little bit of ZBrush. Um, but what I do now is I use this programming environment called Grasshopper, which is a plugin for Rhinoceros. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, an object-based, vis visually organized object-based programming environment. And each object represents a component of geometry. And by creating, uh, you can basically create little flow charts or little algorithms that generate geometry, or in this case, it generates the tool paths that my machine will take. So instead of a 3D model, it's just a three-dimensional tool path. So it's basically like a, a line work that, right. that it's not just a two-dimensional line, it's a, it's a line that traverses three dimensions. And that's how these models exist. So you don't really, there's not, they're not much to look at on the computer. They become interesting when they become physical, you know, when they materialize as clay. Yeah, uh, that's, that's really neat. Um, I, I've been in the 3D printing world for like seven years now, and um, it, I think you're the second person I've met that has been doing uh, kind of programmatic, uh, almost like lattice work, tool path stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, it's and, a little bit niche because it's it's it, it's if you need that level of control. If you need to say, okay, after I print this feature, I want the nozzle to move here and do this thing, Right. you can have that control. And beyond beyond just the X, Y, and Z coordinates, I can also control things like velocity. So if I want some a part of a print to be printed slower so that there's more material extruded, I can do that. I wouldn't be able to do that with traditional 3D printing software. Right. So... Um that brings up an interesting point. You, the clay extrusion that's coming out of your um, extruder, is that controlled through software or is that controlled? It can be. Okay. Today, I'm not doing that. I actually prefer not to. If I want to control the rate of flow, I instead control the velocity that the tool head is moving, okay. that the print head is moving. Um, and instead, I my extruder is just controlled with, I built a 
dedicated extruder controller that just has a knob and I can say, oh, I need a little more flow, I can just turn the knob instead of having to like type in a command and wait right. for it to update. So yeah, I, I prefer that a lot. And it was it was probably months before I realized, oh, I should try this. And I and I try I built a little prototype and it and it was so e much easier to work with. So that's what I do now. I think I almost want that on my normal 3D printer. <laughs> yeah, no, just, I mean, just... <laughs> the, the only thing is that that with a typical 3D printer, you're actually it, uh, I had to I. I I run my printer a little different. It, it's always a constant velocity. Yeah. And there's there's some disadvantages to that. So if I'm taking a sharp corner, there's a little bit of jitter because I can't decelerate and accelerate. Otherwise, it'll throw off my extrusion rate. Right. So there are all these things like I do things a little weird way, but I'm used to it. So I know how to deal with it. But it's not necessarily the most ideal way to do it. Um, but I will say that the continuous flow printing is really big in ceramic 3D printing because it cuts out so many hassles. Yeah. Like dealing with augers and valves and stuff to start and stop the flow. It, and that's been my big hang up from, we've, we've started building two or three different ceramic printers. And it's always been, when we get to the extruder control, that's where it all stalls out. Cause yeah, yeah, it's annoying and, it, and I would recommend anyone just try cutting that, just make it so that it just extrudes at a constant rate. Okay. Even if you don't have a dedicated extruder, just keep, make your velocity constant and make the rate of flow constant. It, it makes things a lot simpler. Very um, cool. There is there is a there is one one artist that I've seen. His name's Keith Simpson, and he he teaches at uh, Alfred University in New York, and he has a really cool, unique way of controlling the flow of the extruder, and it's with an inline, a linear peristaltic pump. Okay. So it also gives his all his prints a really unique characteristic where they're made of little drips of clay instead of a line of clay, an extruded line. And he uses that to his advantage and makes these kind of intricate baskets, things like sculptures that look like baskets. And yeah, it's really beautiful work. So I did take some inspiration there in, in the fact that he just invented his own way of doing it yeah. rather than going with like one of the really great kits that are out there. Uh, he just kind of thought, you know, I'll just invent my own way of doing it. And so I, I wanted to do the same thing. Awesome. Um, i give you... I'm gonna ask one more question. Earlier, my daughter was talking to you, and uh, in the Maker Fair bingo, she had to find an uh, artist that uses math. And I was like, this is the guy you should probably ask that. Uh, and you gave her a really great explanation of how you actually got to the point where you enjoyed math. Can you kind of like reiterate that? Because you and I had very similar experiences, I think. Sure. I mean, it was a very off the cuff, but I can try to cover what I said. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I know I started with what I always say about math, and that's when I was in grade school and high school, uh, and even the beginning of college, I hated math because I, I, I attribute that to the math teachers I had. Not, yeah. that, not that they were bad math teachers, but, but you know, they taught abstract math so there was no application there was no like real world understanding of it it was all just numbers floating in space and um and and also like with you know they i remember my math teacher in high school would say yeah there's a real world application for this like when you're doing grocery shopping and you calculating your bill and it's like well do i do you need to do that don't they do that for you at the cash register but i yeah. mean as soon as i stumbled upon programming like creative coding I immediately fell in love with math and I also really wish that I knew more math yep. that I that I paid more attention in school or that we would have done 3D printing and programming in school that would have been an amazing math class but um, yeah so I mean now I, I use math all the time Mo it's mostly simple arithmetic mm -hmm. and then a little bit of like if I'm doing inverse kinematics for robotic arm it's a little trigonometry but it, like I literally go to a website called mathsisfun.com and it's a website for kids and that's where I find the formulas I need for trigonometry right so it's right. not like it's not this like daunting math you know I think part of the reason that they teach abstract math still is that the, a lot of these like math professors they're like purists you know mm -hmm. they're like math isn't really math unless it's just pure math yeah. right? we don't want physics in there 
We don't want computer science in there. It's just got to be math. And that, I think, steered me away from it. Yep, me um, too. So, but yeah, I mean, I use it in programming. I use it any time I have to do any kind of like logic in programming. I use it in 3D modeling. And then certainly when I'm doing the two combined with like parametric modeling. And, uh, and it's actually like a little bit exciting when I've realized, oh, I have to fig- understand a new formula or I need to understand how Euclidean vectors work because that then it's like just a reminder that math is actually awesome and and everything is math. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. That was yeah, that was exactly the re- reiteration I was hoping for cuz cool. I know we're not alone. Yeah. If- yeah. <laughs> definitely. So, awesome. Well, um, do you have anything that you want to add? Um I mean, I guess that since we're here, I would just say that uh, if you're if you're in Milwaukee in the fall, it's definitely worth coming to the Maker Fair here. I fly back from Canada every year just to participate in it. It's a really great group of people, and um, and yeah, I mean, and I, and I guess I would say like thanks to all those people who organize it. Awesome. Um, is there anywhere online that people can find your work? Yeah, yeah. The best place would be to just follow me on Instagram. Uh, my handle is at Sarah, like Triceratops. Uh, actually, my handle is Sarah.tops. So, like, Triceratops minus the tri and add a dot between Sarah and tops. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll put the link to it in our show notes. Okay, for cool. People. Um, well, this was uh, Joe with Makers on Tap and uh, Brian Sarah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. This, yeah. This was great. Oh, and uh, my daughter would like to say hi as well. Hello, peoples. <laughs> That's Nora. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. So that was the interview with Brian. Brian was really, really cool to talk to and uh, super welcoming to the idea of the podcast. And his project just struck me as so different Um being one, uh, the ceramic printer and his methodology for how he did uh, the programming and how he generated his shapes and all of that. It was just so different in the vast sea of 3D printers that I was surrounded by at Maker Faire and um, and the other 3D printers that I've seen in the world. So I just, I really wanted to sit down and talk with him and he turned out to be really, really cool. Um, And then you guys got to hear from my daughter, Nora, at the end. So that was fun. Um, We will post the uh, websites that he uh, talked about in the show notes, as well as links to uh, Brian's social media. Um, He's always posting updates to uh, what he's doing with his different printers and other kind of like uh, digital manufacturing and uh, digital creation projects. So... um, with that, uh, we will be back with a new full episode next week uh, after one, everyone's had their week off. And, um, yeah, keep making stuff, guys.